Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if they do things like this in school anymore, but back when I was in school, we had a thing called Take Your Kid to Work Day. There were actually two Take Your Kid to Work Days when I was in school. One, if I'm remembering this correctly, for kids when they were in grade eight, and another, again, a year later, for kids when they were in grade nine. That's how I seem to remember it working in my school days anyways. And on these particular days, of course, the kids in those grades would be excused from classes so that they could go to work with one of their parents or perhaps with another adult who maybe worked in a field that they, the child, would be interested maybe in working in someday or something like that. Personally, when I had these take your kid to work days, I just went to work with my parents. The first time, I went to work with my mom, and the second time, about a year later, I went to work with my dad. And what I remember about both of these experiences is that they were both boring. <laughs> my mom, at the time, was a school librarian. She worked in the elementary school, which I had attended when I was in elementary school. And while it was fun as a teenager, a big kid, to go back to the school where I had once been a student and see all my teachers and get to see inside the staff room for the first time ever, I did end up spending most of the day shelving books in the library. It was boring. About a year later, like I said, I went to work with my dad. My dad, of course, was, and still is, a pastor, but my day with him was boring too. My dad was doing office work the morning that I was there with him, writing a sermon or something like that. I don't know. So I ended up helping the church secretary for a little while, and then I went downstairs and helped out with the preschool that went on in the church basement for a little while, and then in the afternoon, my dad went out to visit shut-ins, and I went out to visit shut-ins with him, and while I appreciated the cookies that the shut-in ladies gave to me, for a teenage boy, this was boring. There were various points throughout each of those days where I kind of sort of just wished I had gone to school instead. I was reminiscing about these take your kid to work day memories from my younger years this week as I meditated on our gospel reading today because it seems to me that what's going on here in our gospel reading today is kind of like a take your risen Lord with you to work day kind of thing. In our gospel reading last week, we heard about Jesus appearing to his disciples on two consecutive Sunday evenings as they gathered together in a locked room in Jerusalem. And in the sermon last week, I mentioned that as Jesus did that, as he appeared to his disciples those two Sundays in a row in that locked room, he kind of established a pattern, a pattern of meeting with his disciples week after week on Sundays to forgive their sins, to strengthen them for the living of this life, and to send them out into the world to proclaim the forgiveness of sins that he had given to them. But that was last week's gospel reading and last week's sermon. What we see in our gospel reading this week is that Jesus doesn't just meet with his disciples when they're gathered together on Sundays. Or, to put it another way, Jesus doesn't just meet with us here in church when we're gathered together like we are today. Instead, what we see in this reading today is that Jesus meets with us, his disciples, even on a weekday, even when we are working. In our gospel reading today, Peter and six of Jesus' other disciples, they go fishing. They've 
returned by this point from Jerusalem, which was down in the southern part of Israel, back up north to Galilee, to the seaside region of Galilee, up in the northern part of Israel, which, by the way, is exactly what Jesus had told them to do. Even before Jesus suffered and died, he said, go to Galilee and I'll meet you there. And then after he rose from the dead, he's like, where you guys should be going up to Galilee. That's where I told you to go. But now they've finally gone. And they're there up at the seaside in Galilee, and they decide we're going out fishing. Now, fishing, remember, was the line of work that Peter and at least three of the other disciples had been in before Jesus called them to be disciples. Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen, and they had been fishing one day when Jesus walked along and said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And then just a little while later, Jesus had walked by James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, and said essentially the same thing to them, come follow me. They had been fishermen before Jesus called them. So when Peter and these other disciples, when they head out onto the lake, go out into the Sea of Galilee in order to go fishing, they're not just out for like a ple pleasure, pleasure cruise or something like that, having some fun out on the sea. They're working. They've gone back to work. But as they do, Jesus comes and he stands on the shore. Notice, it's not a Sunday. They're not in church. They're not having some church service out there in the boat. They're working. And yet Jesus comes and appears to them on a weekday while they're working. This makes it clear to us, I think, that our Lord Jesus, risen from the dead, doesn't just meet with us, his disciples, in church on Sundays. He comes to us even on weekdays, even in the midst of our ordinary everyday lives, even while we are working. And as we unpack this reading a little bit, we'll see that as Jesus comes to us on a weekday in the midst of our ordinary lives and while we are working, he powerfully changes and transforms the days of our lives and the work that we do in those days in three important ways. He changes and transforms our days and our work by blessing our work, by forgiving our sins, and by giving us joy. We're going to go through each of those kind of one at a time here, but before we get too far into that, there's a couple of preliminary points that I need to make here. First of all, in talking about going to work and things like that here this morning, I'm very much aware that the majority of you are in fact retired. So you're not actually going off to work. And you may think therefore that everything I'm about to say somehow doesn't apply to you because you don't go to work. That's not true. When I talk about going to work here this morning, I don't just mean people who have a job and go to work. I mean people who get up in the morning and live, right? Whatever it is you're doing, even though you're not punching a clock somewhere, you're still working in some way or another just to keep yourself alive. So that's the first thing, even if you're retired, what I'm about to say still applies to you. And that kind of brings me to my second point too, because we started out here this morning talking about take your kid to work day where my parents took me with them to their jobs. But when we talk about Jesus coming to us in our everyday, ordinary, weekday lives. It's not so much a matter of us bringing Jesus to work with us or something like that, as much as it is that Jesus just comes. Jesus just shows up. The disciples in our reading today, they don't invite Jesus to come along on their fishing trip or anything like that. They don't ask him to be there with them. They just go fishing and there's Jesus. So it's not so much a matter of us asking Jesus to come with us or us bringing Jesus with us as we go about our lives as much as it is us realizing that Jesus is actually already there and us living in the blessings of Jesus actually already being there. And so with those two thoughts in mind, we can start to unpack these three things here, how Jesus changes and transforms our days and our lives by blessing our work by forgiving our sins, and by giving us joy. So we'll start with the first one here. The first thing that Jesus does as he appears to his disciples 
that weekday, while they're out fishing, while they're out working, the first thing that Jesus does is he blesses their work. The disciples had been fishing all night, and they hadn't caught a single thing, not one little fish. As Jesus appears, however, he blesses their work. He fills their nets with fish. And Jesus, our risen Lord, does this for us too. He comes to us in our ordinary everyday lives as we're minding our own business, doing what we're doing, and he blesses our work. Now, we need to be careful with this first point, and I want to be very clear about what I am saying and what I'm not saying. When I say that Jesus is coming to bless us in our work, I don't mean that Jesus is coming to make us wildly successful in our work or something like that. Jesus doesn't promise worldly health, worldly wealth, worldly prosperity to any of his disciples. And that's not what the net full of fish means. It doesn't mean that when Jesus comes to us in our ordinary everyday lives that everything is going to be great all the time and he's going to pour out abundances of blessings on us each and every day that we just kind of scoop them up and we can't even take them all in because they're so great. That's not what we're talking about here. Instead, what this net full of fish in our gospel reading today really teaches us is the truth of something that Jesus had actually previously said back in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, Jesus talks about how he is the vine and we are the branches. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, when Jesus says that, when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he doesn't necessarily mean that we can't do anything without him. There is a sense in which that is true. Jesus is the Lord and the creator of all things. Without Jesus holding the universe together, we couldn't do anything. So I suppose it's true in that sense. But that's not what Jesus means here. The disciples, for example, they were perfectly capable fishermen. Even though our reading today and other instances in the scriptures tell us about times where they utterly fail as fishermen, we have every reason to believe that on most occasions they were able to catch fish for themselves and make a living. Even if Jesus wasn't there, fill in the nets. Instead, what Jesus means here when he says, apart from me you can do nothing, is that without him, without Jesus, we can't really do anything that is actually good or pleasing in the eyes of God. That's what Jesus means. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The fruit Jesus is talking about is the good works that we produce in our lives as Christians. And he's saying you can't produce those without me. Just like a branch, if it's broken off from a tree, isn't going to grow an apple on it. The branch is dead. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When Jesus fills the net of his disciples, however, and he fills that net full of fish, he shows them how he blesses their work. He blesses their work not by giving them an abundance, although that is what happens here, but he blesses their work by turning their ordinary everyday work fishing, throwing a net into the sea and pulling it back out again, by turning that ordinary everyday work into something marvelous, into something miraculous. He takes their work of catching fish and transforms it into a good work, a good and holy work in the eyes of God. And Jesus does the same for us. He blesses our work. He takes the work that we do on an ordinary everyday weekday kind of day and transforms it into something good and pleasing in the eyes of God. Whatever that work is, if it's raising kids, if it's working in whatever your workplace happens to be, if it's doing whatever it is that you happen to do in your retirement, Jesus takes what that work is and blesses it turns it into a good work that's holy and pleasing in the eyes of God. You're not saved by that good work. 
You don't rely on that good work for your salvation. That comes from Jesus alone. But he takes your life and transforms it into a good work. Jesus comes to us in our ordinary, everyday, weekday lives and blesses our work. That's the first thing. The next thing that Jesus does here when he appears to his disciples on a weekday while they are working is that he forgives their sins. We tend to think, I think, of forgiveness as a Sunday at church kind of thing. But Jesus teaches us to think differently here. After the, after the disciples have hauled in their catch of fish, and after they've eaten their breakfast with Jesus on the shore, Jesus and Peter have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. This is at least the fourth time now that Jesus, or that Peter, sorry, has seen Jesus risen from the dead. Three times Peter has seen Jesus together with the other disciples, and one time we're told that Peter saw Jesus one-on-one -on, -one on the Easter Sunday. This is the fourth time then that Peter has seen Jesus since he rose from the dead. But until this point, Jesus hasn't in any of those previous meetings said anything to Peter about that whole business of Peter denying him while Jesus was on trial before the high priest. Jesus, Peter, remember, had denied Jesus three times, saying, I don't know the man. Now, Jesus doesn't say anything specific about Peter's denials here either, but as he asks Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? We see what he's doing, right? He's forgiving Peter. He's restoring Peter. He's reinstituting Peter as a disciple. And three times he says, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He restores him, renews him as what, a pastor to be a preacher of his word. And then he renews his call one more time at the end and says, follow me. So when Jesus appears to his disciples on a weekday, he brings with him the same forgiveness of sins that he brings to his disciples on a Sunday. So that's the second thing. Jesus appears to us even on a weekday to forgive our sins. And finally, Jesus appears to his disciples on a weekday while they are working in order to give them joy. The disciples, when we kind of take a step back here and look at our reading today all together, the disciples don't seem to have been a particularly happy bunch of people when they set out to go fishing that night. You know, Peter kind of says, I'm going fishing. And it kind of sounds like, I'm frustrated. I don't know what else to do. I'm going fishing. And the disciples, the rest of them that are going along, say, okay, whatever, we'll go too. It's not like it's a happy-go-lucky crew of people. And you can bet that when they spent the entire night working, plying their nets in and out of the sea, and they didn't catch a thing, you can bet that they weren't particularly happy people then either. Especially when the sun starts to come up and it's realized that a whole evening has been wasted. But when they see Jesus standing on the shore, everything changes. And not because their net's filled with fish all of a sudden. The joy comes even before the net is filled with fish. The joy comes because they see that it's Jesus there on the shore. And he fills their hearts with joy. He fills their hearts with the kind of joy that would cause Peter to go leaping out of the boat and running through the water to the shore in order to get to Jesus. He can't just wait until they manage to row the boat in. He's got to go now because of this joy that's in his heart. And it's the same kind of joy that we saw in our epistle reading today. The joy that's there in heaven as Jesus crucified and risen from the dead ascends into heaven and takes his place at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that Jesus has conquered death, that his victory is won, and the joy of everything that comes along with Jesus' victory over death. And it's the joy 
that Jesus gives to us, the joy of knowing that our sins are forgiven, the joy of knowing that we have eternal life, the joy of knowing that our bodies will rise again on the last day, and the joy of knowing that our Lord Jesus, risen from the dead, is always present among us. In our everyday lives, we go about it, live in our weekdays, doing what we do. There will be all kinds of causes for joy. There will be happy things that will happen. But there will be just as many, if not more, causes for sorrow. Frustrations and sufferings that just kind of come along in life. Just like for the disciples as they were out there fishing and it's not going particularly well. In the midst of all of that, however, in the midst of all the frustrations and sorrows that there are there in life, we have this joy. The joy of Jesus who is constantly present with us. The joy of Jesus which is more than just a feeling, more than just an emotion. The joy of Jesus which really is Jesus himself and his victory over the grave which is right there with us every single step of the way. Our Lord Jesus isn't just the Lord of Sundays. He is the Lord of Sundays, but he's also the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and risen from the dead. He's the Lord of every single day that ever happens in this creation. And he's present with us, his people, each and every day. He's present with us to bless our work and make it holy. He's present with us to forgive our sins. And he's present with us to give us a joy which the world and all of its sufferings and frustrations cannot take away. And so when you put all that together, what you get is the realization that when Jesus, your risen Lord, comes with you to work, it's never boring. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.